to you and so glad to have you with me. I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. Happy New Year. I hope it's off to a great start. Welcome to Around San Diego. I'll get you caught up on what you may have missed and we'll look ahead at what's to come. Before we get to our top stories though, I want to introduce you to the first San Diego baby born in the new year. Mila Robles was born at midnight at Sharp Mary Birch Hospital. The Robles family says that this is their second child. Mila will be going home to an older brother. Mila's mom says she didn't expect her to be born right when the clock struck 12. It went by so fast. I thought it was going to be definitely a New Year's baby, but not right at midnight, just because of the way my labor was progressing. But the fact that it progressed as quickly as it did, I feel like she was just meant to be the New Year's baby. Oh, yes, Mila weighed in at a healthy seven pounds, two ounces. And another local family welcomed a baby girl on New Year's Day as well. Baby Amelia was the first baby born at UC San Diego Health. She came into this world at 1.20 a.m. Amelia's family tells us that she weighed six pounds, five ounces. Well, now to our top story. Certainly our wet weather this week. The recent storm is bringing some of the biggest waves that we've seen in years. The National Weather Service is predicting waves up to 16 feet and our area is gearing up for coastal flooding. Extreme tides like these can easily cause backup in the San Diego River, which can then cause backflow and lead to major flooding. You know it, especially in areas like Mission Valley. We have about a six, almost seven foot tide, the full moon on Friday, so it's early morning hours that just takes, backs up the water basically. So all the water coming down tonight, it might just be slow because the tide's not flowing out. So it just backs up, backs up. That's when you kind of see a little more of a backflow in, in the waterways. Yeah, another area of concern for anyone trying to surf is the water quality because of runoff. Swimming and surfing is not advised for at least 72 hours after it rains. And with the new rain comes an old problem in the South Bay, contaminated runoff from the Tijuana River. It's been happening for years, but CBS 8's Regina Urita talked to Imperial Beach's new mayor, and she says that progress is being made. This yellow sign has been out here warning beachgoers to stay out of the water here in Imperial Beach because of the contamination that's coming from the Tijuana River. Now this issue has been going on for decades, but now that federal legislators have unlocked funding, there may be progress in the near future. What's a beach city if not to enjoy the shores? Well, for Imperial Beach, these keep out signs have continued to disappoint swimmers hoping to get in the water. I often walk to the Tijuana River and whatnot, and uh, it uh, some days we can't get down there because the smell is so bad. And that's because during every rainstorm, Imperial Beach and sometimes even Coronado get plagued by contaminants stemming from the Tijuana River urban runoff. That runoff has been known to make people sick. Here you can see the runoff from today. You have solid waste, plastics, trash, waste tires, animal waste, you name it. In the past year, constant beach closures have only hurt businesses and discouraged tourists. The county's new DNA testing has also shown high levels of bacteria even when Tijuana rivers are dry. And still the challenge remains on how to stop the flow of sewage from Tijuana. But a new allocation of 300 million federal funds could finally aim to have shovels in the ground within the next two years. A project that includes rerouting wastewater, fixing sewage pipes, and replacing the sewage treatment plant in Tijuana. So what we can expect is that it goes to our uh, request for proposals, for contractors, the, the, the contracts allocated, um, and then eventually we just get shovels in the ground. Still, this week's heavy rain has continued to push another trail of contaminants from the south to the north. A lot of that rain is just runoff, right? So you have a lot more flooding, um, a lot more slippery roads. It's, 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 it's chaotic, so um, it's concerning, of course. Another water contact warning remains in effect from Imperial Beach to La Jolla. Normally when it rains, we are asked to stay out of the water for 72 hours in the southern part of Imperial Beach. That has been closed for over a year, which is why leaders have been pushing for a solution to solve these issues. Regina Yurita, CBS 8. Regina, thanks. And rain for us often means snow in the mountains. On Monday, we took a trip to Mount Laguna to see how much powder came down. CBS 8 photojournalist Anne Marie Spaulding takes us up for a closer look. Oh, it's beautiful. It's nice views. You're going up the mountain. You get to see everything what this world has to offer us. It's awesome. <laughs> we just wanted to 
see some snow and play in it a little bit. It's beautiful out here. I mean, literally, it's very picturesque, and we had some fun throwing snow at each other, trying to make a snowman. <laughs> Nature is beautiful. It's like, look at all this. We go from having the beach a few miles away to coming out here and having this. That's the best part. I had to come up here. And, you know, it's my first time jeeping in the snow. So. It's nature. It's beautiful. A sled in the car, so we're gonna go up the mountain. We're gonna go sledding. Sledding down on a half broken sled. <laughs> it only lasted us like five minutes before we got here and it broke. <laughs> That's a lot of work. <laughs> it is. Make some time. <laughs> Are you having fun? Yeah. <laughs> Get out here with the family. Enjoy your time. It's been great. A little chilly. The snow, of course. Yeah, we're hey! in the house. I'm out of here. You got a snow angel? No, oh, it was fun. <laughs> Hit me in the stuff. <laughs> we don't get to experience this too, much, too often, you know, we only get it a certain time of the year, so just come out and have a good time. Yeah, right in our own backyard. It is so beautiful year round. Well, your SDG&E bills are high right now, but brace yourself. They are about to get even higher. We've been working for you on this story for well over a year, and now there's a rate hike that could double your bill. CBS 8 Shannon Handy talked with SDG&E executives about what's behind the jump that's making a lot of people upset. We recognize that it is hard. Helen Gao is a senior communications manager for SDG&E. Following last year's fallout over record high bills, she told me the company wants to be more transparent about what's to come. For gas alone, if your household peak winter bill was $105 last January, you can expect your January 2023 bill to be $225. Customers who are enrolled in the Care Bill Discount Program could see their January gas bill increase from $60 to $130. This is going to upset a a lot of people, bills are already high enough. Why are they going even higher? One of the key reasons is because of the conditions of the natural gas market. According to sdg &E, the cost per unit of natural gas, also known as a therm, has more than doubled for the month of January, increasing from 236 per therm in January 2022 to 511 per therm in January 2023. Gao claims sdg &E doesn't profit from that. What we pay in the market to get natural gas or electricity for our customers we don't mark that up. If we pay a dollar for natural gas, our customers pay a dollar. But a bill is made up of more than just natural gas. I told Gao I wanted an explanation why other costs are going up and why we pay more than anyone else in the country. She says wildfire mitigation projects and modernizing the grid so it can handle more renewables, energy storage, and electric vehicles play a role. As for the delivery fee increase, Gao says it's costing more to deliver energy into homes. That's the cost of the infrastructure, the pipes, the wires, the power poles that get the energy to your home. But that explanation does little to his customers' concerns, including Tammy Smith. Last week, she told us her bill went up more than $137 compared to the same month a year ago. If it keeps going up, I don't know what I'm going to do. I show Gal the interview and ask what options do people like Tammy have? How are people supposed to afford that? We have debt relief, we have payment plans, we have bill discounts, and we have energy efficiency programs. That Gal says sgg &E will work with customers yeah. to ensure their lights stay on. Long term, they're pushing for rate reform at the state level. When asked if continuous rate hikes are the new norm, she says it's possible bills will go down after January when the demand for natural gas declines, but even that's not guaranteed. We recognize how difficult this is, what a tough situation it is for local families. We want them to know that we are are here to help them. Shannon Handy, CBS 8.
Yeah, and while gas is going up the most, electricity is also on the rise. That could cost the average bill payer about $25 more a month. If you do want to see those programs that Shannon mentioned that could help you pay your bill, just go to CBS8.com and click on this story. And don't forget, here at CBS8, we are working for you. If there's something you'd like us to look into, email us at workingforyou at CBS8.com. Well, more fallout for Southwest following the Christmas travel chaos. A class action lawsuit is now in the works. The year, more than 15,000 Southwest flights were canceled. The U.S. Department of Transportation is looking into the series of issues, and Southwest could face fines. But again, a class action lawsuit is in the works. One path this is really an anomaly. to get more people on board is accusing Southwest of violating federal law. He says instead of providing prompt refunds for canceled flights, the airline offered a credit toward a future flight. For some, a little too late, but Southwest is now offering that full refund for canceled or even substantially delayed flights from Christmas Eve to January 2nd. They are also reimbursing travelers who were forced to make other arrangements and giving 25,000 frequent flyer bonus points to those who were impacted. That could be worth up to about $300. As for that massive pile of lost luggage, Southwest has partnered with FedEx and even competing airlines to get bags returned by the end of this week, they say. There are still about 100 suitcases unaccounted for at San Diego International. We spoke with one woman who finally made it here from Florida to celebrate her dad's 98th birthday. She was thrilled to find her suitcase and says she'll forgive Southwest. This is really an anomaly what happened here, and I'm sure that everything's going to be corrected, but um, yeah, I love I also fly Southwest. Yeah, our favorite line in TV news, pack your patience. Meantime, the San Diego Humane Society is overwhelmed after seeing a flood of strays come in over the holiday weekend. The shelter was already way over capacity, and it took in then more than 75 strays after New Year's Eve. Capacity for them is considered 350, but there are now more than 600 dogs and cats being cared for because the shelter doesn't turn anyone away. If you find a stray, you are asked to try getting them back to their owner on your own. Oftentimes lost pets aren't far from home. It's recommended to post photos on Facebook or groups like next door to get them reunited with their family. We don't exactly know the cause of why we're seeing so many stray pets. We can certainly speculate that it has something to do with the economy. Um, it's also uh, harder to move when you have big pets. Yeah, the shelter is also encouraging people to foster or adopt to help clear out those kennels. For more information on CBS, uh, we have more information on CBS8.com if you are interested in getting involved. Well, there are a handful of new California laws in this new year. Many of them are designed to make it safer on the road. People are now allowed to jaywalk. Also, more bicyclist protection will come in 2023. Drivers will have to move over and slow down if passing a bike lane. And another new law, CHP will send out a yellow alert when a fatal hit and run happens so that it helps investigators solve these cases would beep and they would give you the information, the location and the last direction of travel. It also would give you the suspect information uh, regarding the, the situation that they're involved in. Known as the pink tax is now officially outlawed here in California as well in the new year. This means products for women can no longer cost significantly more than their male counterparts. CBS 8's Richard Allen has more on the financial impact and the fines that violators now face. This has been a fight that's gone on for years and years and years. And over those years, studies show that women in California pay on average $2,381 more every year for the same goods and services as their male counterparts, adding up to about $188,000 over the course of a lifetime. Melissa Burton is executive director of The Pad Project, a nonprofit which fights for gender equity. Male or female, you probably have gone through your local market and seen pretty you know, what some may see as pretty pink packaging, but in fact, the actual razor or the soap 
or the lotion is not substantively different. What is often different, though, is the price. One government study found personal care products targeted to women were on average 13% more expensive than similar men's products. We're still getting paid less and to have to be charged more for the products that we use every day. San Diegans Lauren Pope and Ashley Hammer say the pink tax is fundamentally unfair. That's why I use men's razors, men's deodorant, all any men product that I can get is in my bathroom. We've been fighting for years for this equality. It's a really exciting day that we have it here in California. Bay Area Assembly Member Rebecca Bauer Cahan authored AB 1287, eliminating the pink tax in the Golden State. Well, what it's designed to do is ensure that goods that are marketed to men and women are sold for the same price. So the women aren't paying more for goods that are marketed to us. While stores have some time to get into compliance, those who continue to violate this new law could face fines ranging from $10,000 to $100,000 per incident. Our unscientific study showed that while for the most part prices for many of the same products were identical, we spotted some outliers like this $1 difference for razors and 50 cents difference for shaving gel. In each case, the women's version was more. The bill explicitly exempts product that cost more to manufacture or that the stores are paying more for. So the stores will not be on the hook if they are paying more for a product. And for more information on repealing the pink tax, as well as other new laws that have gone into effect this new year, just head to our website, cbs8.com. Richard, thank you. Well, private citizens here in California can also now sue anyone who violates the state's laws against the manufacturing, distribution, or sale of illegal weapons in California. Governor Gavin Newsom came up with the idea after Texas passed a similar law regarding abortion. Our political reporter Morgan Reiner is working for you and has more on what you need to know for 2023. For the most part, the law took effect yesterday, but a U.S. district judge down in San Diego actually blocked a portion of the law. The portion that the judge blocked would have required the gun industry to pay for the legal fees of the person or group that sued them, even if the gun industry won their case. Texas passed a law known as SB8 that allows people who aren't connected to an abortion to sue anyone who performs or facilitates one and receive up to $10,000 in damages. If they're going to use this framework to put women's lives at risk, we're going to use it to save people's lives. So Newsom copied the law here in California, but instead of abortion, he did it for guns. There are 40 million people that can collect $10,000. Former Senator Bob Hertzberg volunteered to put the idea into a bill form. I interviewed him about his bill back in April. So if someone has a ghost gun or an assault weapon and your neighbor sees it and they can see that you transported it or that you have possession of it. All of a sudden they can get $10,000 plus attorney's fees. Gun rights organizations sued. The case is still going through the legal process, but a U.S. District Court judge blocked one part of the law from taking effect in the meantime. The part that would have required the gun industry to pay for legal fees, even if they won the case. What they've determined is there's a good likelihood that the plaintiff is going to win and 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 that is an aspect of it that will cause harm right away. So that's the only reason why it was enjoined. Publisher of a Second Amendment news site, Craig DeLue, said the average citizen is not going to know if a gun is illegal. How are you going to determine if someone has, has broken California's gun laws? So he believes if lawsuits start coming in, it will be through larger organizations. These are organizations with, with deep, deep pockets. Uh, and their their whole goal, quite frankly, is going to be to sue individuals, to sue firearms retailers, and basically in order to put them out of business. When the news came out that the judge blocked the portion of the law, Governor Gavin Newsom applauded the decision, saying that this just proves that the Texas law is also unconstitutional because the California one is mirrored based off of the Texas law. Morgan, thank you. Well, we are now hearing from San Diego County's new sheriff, Kelly Martinez. CBS 8 talked to her about the biggest issues that she will face while in office, including inmate deaths. She said a lot of changes have been made in the past year to try and prevent future deaths. Now do metal. Mental health and medical screening right at intake. We do urine screening at intake. We've got an expanded medically assisted treatment program uh, that we're using. We've got more naloxone in the facilities. We're reducing the fentanyl that's coming into our facilities. We need to stop and stem that tide and uh, really just continue with all of the improvements. 
Yeah, Sheriff Martinez also expressed her sympathy to the families whose loved ones have died while in custody. It's a terrible thing anytime someone dies in our custody, and it's terrible for the families who do not are not connected to their loved one while they're in our care. And uh, I really, absolutely, my heart goes out to everyone who's experienced that. Yes, yeah, Sheriff Martinez has been with the department for nearly 40 years now and is the first woman to serve as sheriff in San Diego County. Well, it's almost been two years since Maya Miliette went missing from her Chula Vista home, and to this day, her body has not yet been found. Her husband, Larry Miliette, is the primary suspect and is charged with her murder. A hike for Maya is planned for this Saturday on the two-year anniversary of her disappearance. It's being held at Mount San Miguel Park in Chula Vista at 9 a.m. The missing mother of three used to go for hikes there, which is near the family's home. Everybody's welcome, kids are welcome, uh, family, whole family is welcome to, to join us. Yeah, Larry Miliete has pleaded not guilty to the murder and his attorney continues to maintain his innocence. A preliminary hearing in the case will be held on Wednesday. Well, internet crimes against children have tripled since the start of COVID. So the district attorney's office is starting an outreach campaign to focus on the sex trafficking of boys. It's often in online gaming rooms where predators begin to lure their victims. So I spoke with the DA about the new push to protect children. The San Diego County District Attorney's Office prosecutes about 50 child sex trafficking cases a year, but they estimate there are closer to 5,000 victims victims annually. Both girls and boys fall victim. So the DA partnered with Health and Human Services and Child Welfare Services to educate us on the dangers, increase reporting, and better support survivors. January is Sex Trafficking Awareness Month, and in the coming weeks, you'll see more billboards, bus transit posters, and information online. The average age for girls to enter the sex slave trade is 15 or 16, but for boys, it's closer to 11. The DA says they see a lot of runaways, boys who have been abandoned or abused by their family. There have also been cases of fathers selling their sons for sex in order to get money or drugs. Trafficking is not often obvious. It isn't the kidnap off the street. It's not the movie stolen. Well over 90% of our cases are psychological deception where the child feels that the trafficker is their friend. Yeah, the district attorney's office works to shut down organized pimping and trafficking rings, as well as detect online ads that are written deceptively. For example, an advertisement for sex with a minor may use words like fresh and innocent. It really is disturbing, but knowledge is power, so we are encouraged to trust our instincts and speak up. Because sadly, it is rare for a victim to run to police because they may be scared or ashamed. So also parents have that tough conversation about not talking to strangers online. We've provided more helpful info on CBS8.com. Just click on the help button. Well, the recent death of LA's beloved mountain lion, P-22, is a reminder that protected spaces and crossings are needed to ensure the health and safety of countless urban wildlife in Southern California. A new exhibit at the San Diego Natural History Museum highlights the use of technology to study animals roaming around the county. Our chief meteorologist, Carlene Chavez, talks to experts at the Nat about efforts to preserve their existence. We're not the only ones that live here in San Diego. We also have to protect our wildlife and camera traps like this one are used to monitor their every move. I'm here at the Nat for a new exhibit that's opened up and also talking about wildlife protection. animals that are most of them are secretive like the mountain lion that are hard to see and that's why camera trap and technology and photography is so cool because it allows us actually to observe these animals um, doing things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see them doing. While most mountain lions shy away from the limelight 
but there's always one rebel in the family. P22's proximity to urban, a huge urban space, I think made that cat special. This famed Los Angeles cougar species was often talked about on social media, reported on and seen on camera traps roaming the eastern side of the Santa Monica Mountains near Griffith Park. After years of severe health challenges stemming from habitat isolation, car strikes and rat poisoning, P22 was compassionately euthanized back in December. Unfortunately, P22's struggles are obstacles faced by all urban wildlife throughout Southern California, which includes our own backyard. The Director of Conservation Biology, Dr. Michelle Thompson, pinpoints the harsh realities for our fellow mammals. Being stuck in an artificially small um, habitat, not being able to move around, exposure to toxins and pollution, in the case of P22, rat poison, and then also the danger of roads. So traffic is, is a big danger for urban wildlife. The death of the beloved mountain lion continues to shed light on the importance of linking wild protected spaces for wildlife to roam. Luckily for us, the layout of our county is a big help. We actually have uh, all these urban canyons in San Diego, and you just don't build inside of canyons. And so with those, that allows us uh, to have so much, so much connectivity from one reserve, one big open area to another. It's just a, a wonderful component that we were just uh, gifted to have. Despite our ideal topography, getting from point A to point B has its challenges for our wildlife, whether they have two legs or four. Unfortunately, the bigger the animal, the higher the safety risk. They're just not as agile and um, yeah, they're, they're much more impacted. Generally, the larger, the larger those animals, the, more, uh, the less there are. And so populations are, are highly affected um, by just a single major roadway. Scott Tremor, a mammologist at the NAT, teams up with agencies that govern wildlife, along with transportation and utility agencies to make sure navigating crossings is less treacherous for them. There are already safe crossings under State Route 52 between Santo Road and Mast Boulevard, and another at Scripps Poway Parkway. And more projects are in the works, including a crossing over the 15 near Rainbow, which would benefit the mountain lions traveling between the Santa Ana Mountains to Palomar Mountain, and along a troublesome stretch of road where the population of these cuties has boomed. One of the areas where animals are getting killed regularly is right next to Mount Woodson along Highway 67. So it's a, it's a pinch point, but there's a really great population of these ringtails. The gnat has been studying these tiny long-tailed cousins of raccoons because little is known about them here in the Golden State. And with quite the population of them in the boulders of Mount Woodson, they are working with Caltrans and other agencies for safe movement across the 67. There are many more planned um, and in, in the discussion phases as we, as we find better ways for uh, wildlife to persist in this region. Because we have to remember, our health is reliant on theirs. Well, it's important to maintain biodiversity and, you know, people are also very connected to ecosystem health, so it's important for people and nature. You tell them, Dr. Thompson. For CBS 8, I'm Chief Meteorologist Carlene Chavis. Whew, just incredible. Carlene, thanks. We have to coexist, right? Well, walking across the border will soon get a little faster. The Pedestrian West facility at the San Ysidro Port of Entry is reopening next week. It will be operating during limited hours, though, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. U.S. Customs and Border Protection says they are actively working to improve wait times for travelers crossing the border. The pedestrian crossing is officially set to reopen next Monday after two years of being closed to the public. We'll take a look at this cruise at Snapdragon Stadium. We're revving up for Monster Jam and Supercross. 26 million pounds of dirt was hauled in Wednesday to build the track. The Monster Jam course is built for high-flying destruction and epic stunts, while the unique Supercross tracks have one-of-a-kind layouts for obstacles and jumps. Monster Jam will officially start this weekend. It will then return for an encore on the 14th and 15th. Wow, to see that transformation. 
Well, the city of Oceanside is partnering with a North County College to help fill some jobs and build new careers. Oceanside residents are eligible for the free job training program through Miracosta College. They can learn skills that could lead to careers in everything from biomedical to welding and even brewing beer. The goal is to help fill needed jobs at Oceanside businesses. So often our students think that college and going to university is the only way they can get a really great career and a high paying job. And I really want to let people know that there is more than that available. Yeah, the program is accelerated and participants typically complete it in one semester. You can learn more on CBS8.com. Well, right now, there is an urgent need for volunteers at Feeding San Diego. The organization says the number of volunteers dropped in the new year. Feeding San Diego rescues surplus food from businesses and farms and then helps get it into people's homes who need it across the county. And it's all made possible with the help of people who volunteer their time. Our CBS State team, myself included, did it just a few weeks ago. So if you would like to volunteer, we have posted that information on our website. Just click the help button. Well, making it to 100 years old is certainly an incredible achievement, but this week we are celebrating a woman who made it to 108. Ginny Bergman celebrated her birthday at the Remington Club, an assisted living facility in Rancho Bernardo. Ginny was born in 1914 in New Jersey. She settled down in Rancho Bernardo back in 1986 after her husband's death. We asked her what her secret is to a long life. Let's live every day to the fullest. Enjoy every single day. I will, I love that. Jenny has a few other tips for staying young. She says, always have something to look forward to and find the humor in everything and eat everything but in moderation. As always, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for staying informed. Be sure to join us each week as we take you around San Diego. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take good care of yourself and may 2023 be so good to you.